Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There it is. Just when I was going to come to you. Good morning, everyone. Let's try one more time. Everybody in the balcony, everybody in the back, and, you know, slightly around the corner, and the down front dwellers. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> hey, it's good to be together with you all this morning in worship. If you are a guest joining us here at Mission Hills, either in person or you're watching the service online, we want to welcome you warmly. My name is Pastor Jamin. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to be with you this morning to worship the Lord. As we begin this morning, as we've been doing the last several weeks, as we walk through this series, The Aroma of Christ, some of you have been with us now for several weeks, and you know that each Sunday we've had a, a different missionary or ministry partner connected to our church, uh, bringing the word and the sermon every single Sunday. And what we've also done each Sunday is introduced you to folks that we as a church partner with in the local community here in San Diego County. And so this morning, I want to introduce you to one more of those partners and have, give them an opportunity to share with you about their ministry and how else we can continue to support them and be involved. So can you warmly welcome this morning Levi from the Anchor? Thank you for uh, letting me come out. I appreciate it. First thing I want to say is I want to say thank you to the Women's Bible Study. Uh, there's been such a great help over the years of donating items and supporting us. So thank you so much for that. We appreciate that so much. Uh, real quick, so uh, you guys know what the anchor is? Uh, it is a facility out north side where you can come support the military and help them. There's a lot of ways to serve. And uh, it's not just for guys. There's whole families. And, and you can come out and find out what it's about. Uh, sometimes the misconception is it's only men. And there's women. There's children. And then on top of that, we have many ways to serve behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. And um, I just want you to know that, and I will get you my information so you can do that. But I think you have some questions for me. Well, <laughs> why don't you share a little bit more about what you guys do, how you guys connect with folks in, on the base in particular, and how they can, any practical ways they can okay. support. So uh, first thing, if you want to help, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm pretty open about this. So I'm going to right now give you my cell phone number. All right, so if you want to write it down, because it's the fastest way to get a hold of me, because I'm always on the go. So if you're ready. I'm not going to give you my cell phone number, <laughs> if that's okay. But So if you're interested, <laughs> here's my cell phone number, okay? It's 808-782-6294. Again, 808-782-6294. It's a Hawaii number. I was stationed out there. <laughs> um, but contact me, and we can set up where you can come see it. Get a feel for it and see if it works for you. The ways you can help is there's cooking, cleaning, uh, sharing the gospel, playing chess with the Marine and just talking with them, playing different games, uh, coming out and just loving on them. And there's all kinds of capacity. And then we take items to base and we just uh, help support in that area. So if you're a behind the scenes person, you could always make a meal or you can go to Costco and buy a case of water, a case of Gatorade. There's so many ways to go about it that you can help. But any way of support uh, that you can is, is great, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Levi. Well, can we pray over Levi and the anchor ministry here in San Diego County to our military? And would you just extend a hand as I pray over him and his ministry this morning? Father, we thank you so much for Brother Levi and the ministry, the anchor, and their outreach to those who serve here and are in our community. Lord, they're engaging in conversations and interactions every week. There are opportunities to share the good news of Jesus in word and in deed. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit would lead and guide their ministry, your hand of favor would be upon their ministry as they, they seek to move into these conversations and spaces with uh, military servicemen and their families. Lord, as we've continued to support them in the years past, that you would continue to uh, use uh, the ways in which uh, our church has partnered with them to further your kingdom and the advancement of your gospel. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we give, th give thanks to Levi again for being here this morning? Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, as we continue here in worship, just one other quick thing I wanted to flag for you in your, 
your worship folder there that is of particular importance. Everything there is important, of course, and encourage you to look at the front and the back and see what's going on in the life of the church and ways you can connect and be involved. But the one thing in particular I want to flag for your attention is that big boxed Easter announcement there, the bottom of your inside page. It gives you kind of an update on when our Good Friday service will be on uh, Friday, April 2nd, and then when the Easter services will be. We have, a, as we've done in years past, we'll have a sunrise service here at 630 and then two services at 9 and 11. So um, I know that it's important to kind of coordinate and plan your time and your schedule for your family. And so I uh, encourage you to plan that now and encourage you to be thinking about friends, neighbors, coworkers, family that you can invite to Easter service to hear the good news of Jesus. Really encourage you to be praying about that. Is there someone the Lord would maybe have you invite that doesn't know Jesus yet that you could invite to hear the good news and to celebrate Easter with us as a church family? So with that, would you turn to Psalm 107, Psalm 107, and we'll read uh, verses 1 through 3 and 17 to 22 for our call to worship this morning. As you're turning there, just a, a brief reminder this morning that as the, the scripture reading uh, portion of the service happens and the sermon is beginning, if you have 7 to 10 year olds, you can check back into the Connection Center for their kind of group outside during the sermon and I believe Adam's meeting with middle schoolers today as well during the sermon. So if you're in middle school and you want to connect back at the Connection Center during the sermon following worship, that'd be the time to do it. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 17 to 22 for our call to worship this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let's give you down to verse 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. They drew near to the gates of death and they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word. And healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Would you join me in prayer? As you turn your heart's attention to God in prayer, as you bow your heads, I want to invite you to begin by just kind of checking in with God. The Lord invites us to come into worship and to offer ourselves to him, to offer our bodies, our hearts, our minds in worship. But as a first step in doing so, he invites us to kind of show up, to bring before him our lives, to bring before him our hearts, show up in the truth of who we are. And so just take a moment in prayer and come check in with God. What do you show up with this morning? Do you arrive at church with some anxiety, some worry or fear about something in life right now? Do you arrive with hope, expectation, longing? Perhaps you arrive with a sense of guilt or shame. Just share those things with the Lord for a moment. If you arrive this morning with an anxiety or a worry, his, his invitation to you this morning is come to him. In him you will find rest. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you come to him with hope and expectation this morning, maybe with a particular longing or prayer request, he invites you to ask. Ask for what you desire. Present your request to the Lord as a, as a child 
with a father who longs to care for his children. If you come this morning with a sense of guilt, perhaps genuine guilt for sin you have committed this past week, even in your life, or recent days, he invites you to confess your sin to him, to repent. And to once again receive for him the good news of forgiveness that is known in Christ Jesus. All the benefits that come with trusting in Christ's death and resurrection. Freedom. Forgiveness. Reconciliation. Redemption. So, Father, here we are. We, we, we come this morning as a people, the people who have indeed sinned, the people who are indeed anxious and worried about many things, the people who have longings and hopes and desires. And we come to you, Lord, knowing that you and you alone are where we can find life. You and you alone are the love that our hearts most deeply long for. And so we come this morning to thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love, as the psalmist says. To thank you for your wondrous works. We come together to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and to proclaim your deeds with songs of joy. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's sing this song together, all creatures of our God and King. Rushing wind, thou rushing wind, who art so strong. Ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise him, sing hallelujah. Thou rising moon in praise rejoice. Ye lights of evening find a voice.
and sing little things. Let all things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him, sing hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your love for us this morning. Yes, I've worn shackles and chains, but I've been freed and forgiven. I'm not going back. No, I'll never be the same. Sing all my hope. And all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God. I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. Break him down to his knees. Oh, oh, oh. God, I've been broken more than a time or two yet. But he picked me up and showed me what it means to trust in him. Oh, oh, oh. sing all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. Oh, and all my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. Let's sing that together again. All my hope. And all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterdays go on. And all my sins are 
are forgiven and I've been washed by the blood and I've been washed by the blood and I've been washed by the Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your love for us. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us constantly. Your mercies are new every morning. That phrase rings even now. So, Father, we worship you with our hearts. Ask that you would continue to be with us now and speak to us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Hello. There we go. All right. Good morning, church family. <laughs> My name is Aaron Richardson, and our scripture and passages this morning it's from John 20, verses 19 to 21. All right, starting in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Aaron. Well, good morning, church family. I get the privilege once again of introducing our speaker, but before I do, I want to remind you of a couple things. We actually are out of these at the Connection Center, but they are available online. You can follow along. So this is our prayer guide, praying for the nations and specifically each week praying for those who we partner with. And this week, you'll see on Monday that we're praying for Matt and Nikki Paschal. Um, and just encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to, to be in prayer, not only for our missionaries and the folks that we join together with in partnering uh, to bring the gospel to those who haven't heard, also praying for the nations through this. So you can find that online. The other thing I want to remind you, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, we've introduced this each week, and Dave, who's going to be preaching to us here in a few moments, he'll be teaching one of the lessons in this coming up. So this will begin the first week of April. You can sign up at the Connection Center. You can sign up online. <clears throat> the cost for the course is actually for the book. If you decide that you would like to um, take the course and just kind of audit, um, you can join without actually getting the book. But if you want the book, uh, the cost is $15 for the book. So it'll be online. It'll be in person on Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening. So sign up. It's, it's a unique opportunity to hear from from the folks who have preached to us, from folks who have a breadth and depth of experience um, on a topic that is hopefully revolutionary in the sense that would just change your perspective on what God is doing and how God is working and the task before us. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Dave Hall and Joni are friends of ours from our days at Emmanuel Faith, Dave started out as a youth pastor, like many of us start our ministry and youth work, um, and then became an outreach pastor in Pennsylvania, and then for the most of our time overseas, he was our direct uh, pastor whom we interacted with and got encouragement from. Um, he came to visit us in Kazakhstan when we were there, and he was at Emmanuel Faith for about 15 years, and then recently he's just become 
the international director for the mission team, and he works now here from California, but travels and, and does uh, support and encouragement and training and development. And so, Dave, if you come on up, and it's a privilege, why don't you welcome Dave? Privilege to hear from Dave today, sharing God's word. Thank you, Mike. Mike was, has been and still is one of the best traveling companions I've ever had going overseas. If you ever have a chance to travel overseas with Mike Goule, take the opportunity. Uh, he's one of the best, and he can take a trip that otherwise might seem mundane and make it a lot of fun. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Um, it's... Um, it's a privilege. Uh, we were praying together before the service began, and um, Jamin mentioned that we sometimes take for granted a getting together as people assembling and being with other followers of Christ. And if anything I've learned this last year is how special that is. And so I, I consider it a real privilege even just to be here and sing with you and listen to God's word read. I've already been blessed by that, so it's a, it's a treat for me to be here with you. Uh, you heard or read just a few moments ago uh, a conversation <clears throat> that took place between Jesus. Uh, mostly you didn't hear what his followers had to say. You heard what Jesus had to say to them. It was a conversation that happened in private at that moment. Little did they know that it would be recorded in scripture and read for hundreds and hundreds of years later. They thought they were all alone and they thought they were in secret. But here we are today in the 21st century reading about that private conversation it happened uh, at a, after a very tumultuous and chaotic week for these men. Um, it had happened, this conversation that we heard read, in the hours just after Jesus' death, and uh, they had heard stories that he had been seen alive. Most of those men had not seen him yet. <clears throat> and so it was a very uh, emotional um, experience for them to have them there in his presence once again. And it had been a joyous, at the beginning of the week, a very joyous, what seemed to be a very triumphant week as Jesus entered into the cities, only, under the city of Jerusalem only days before today's scripture reading. But they had seen a mob turn on Jesus and just days, just a few days before the events that we heard read, uh, uh, he was brutally taken from them by a mob their leader, their teacher, the man that they had spent years traveling with and learning from and had come to love and respect. And now with their lives at risk, they scattered into the night in hiding, fearful of these crowds and mobs in Jerusalem. And over a, a brief period of just a few days, those crowds had turned violently against this gentle teacher the one who had displayed uncommon courage in confronting the abuse and hypocrisy of the religious establishment of the day, while at the very same time, as, he, as he, his itinerant teaching ministry took him through the countryside of Israel, he had also demonstrated compassion and care for the most vulnerable and the weak among them. For three years, Jesus had openly proclaimed, not in hiding, but openly had proclaimed through his words and his deeds, that a gracious and righteous kingdom of God was now among them. But now, in today's scripture reading, torn apart from his traveling bands of disciples, Jesus had just hours before been savagely beaten, he'd been mocked, he'd been unjustly crucified before a very angry mob. And we're all familiar with the story, and in coming weeks, we will be celebrating once again the events of those and the historic significance of those events, not only in history in general, but in our lives personally, as redeemed followers of Jesus. As we read in this passage, they gathered in fear in a private room in an undisclosed location in Jerusalem. No doubt they were trying to figure out what their next steps were going to be. Things had not turned out as they had expected. It had taken a very dark turn for the worse. And in fear, they were hiding out in a room trying to understand what the future could be for them. And then Jesus miraculously appears among them, startled, as only I can imagine, their nerves having already been on edge for quite some time. 
he offers them first words of reassurance and comfort, and immediately their spirits lift. It says they're glad to see him, as only we can imagine. The one they had come to love and admire was now reunited with them. The seemingly impossible had taken place. And then Jesus makes what seemed to be in that moment probably an extraordinary announcement. One again that they were probably not expecting to hear. He says in verse 21, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. How do you imagine they reacted to that news? What emotions would they have experienced? Try to put yourself in that room, having seen and heard all the things that had happened in the days leading up to that moment when they're hiding out in fear. How would you have reacted had you seen and experienced all that they had in the last few days? And then Jesus comes before you and says, just like the Father sent me, I am now sending you. I'm not so sure I would have been all that eager to hear such news, to be quite honest with you. I'm not at all certain I would have seen myself as confident and ready to accept such a mission. Remember what they had just witnessed themselves. No doubt this is why Jesus later instructs them to remain in Jerusalem. And you can, this can be found in Luke chapter 24 in Luke's telling of this event. Jesus later instructs them to remain in Jerusalem until he is able to send, he uses the phrase, the promise of my father upon them and they are as he, as jesus says in luke 24 clothed with power from on high he knew these men didn't have in themselves the natural talent ability bravery courage intellect resources to accept now this mission that god had given to his son and now he is going to send them he knew that they weren't ready for that in that moment he knew that in themselves they did not have what they needed to fulfill this mission that would require the working of the Holy Spirit in them and through them. And in the coming pages of the New Testament, as you move into Acts chapter 1, we see how God fulfills that promise and transforms these men for the mission that Jesus is now conferring upon them. Earlier in John chapter 7, in prayer with his father, Jesus had already discussed with his father this coming wave of sending that would follow his own sending into the world. Not only the sending of these disciples, but coming generations of disciples down through the history of the church, which even comes to us today. Jesus in John 17 prays for these men and those who will follow, people like you and I who know and follow Christ. In his intercessory prayer as recorded in John 17, he tells his father in verse 8, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The mission did not end with Jesus coming. It was only in some ways just beginning. And indeed, the most important part of that mission, the part that only Jesus himself could fulfill, had been done by him. It now was being turned over to those who follow Christ. And here in John 17, we see of Jesus interceding for these friends of his, his followers, those who would later follow after them, people like you and me. Jesus understood and accepted the immensity of the mission into which he had been sent as a one-time sacrifice for sin, conqueror of sin and of death. And now his followers would be entrusted with the gospel of redemption and hope, taking it to all peoples of the earth. We've heard it read in scripture. We heard it sung this morning, this good news of hope, of life, of forgiveness of sin, of freedom, of liberation that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus understood that the redemptive mission of God in restoring a broken and fallen world of sinful people would be carried forward through his finite and very, very human followers. Broken sinners who are in the process of being made whole by his grace. That's an unbelievable thought to, 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 to dwell upon. The God of the universe, in redeeming a broken and sinful fallen world, entrusts that message to the very people who are desperately in need of it. He didn't send angels. He didn't send any other 
extraterrestrial beings of any sort. God's plan, beginning with his son Jesus coming into this world, is now being shared with those who've come by his grace to know and be being put back together, sin forgiven, lives restored. These are the people, these are the instruments of God's plan in fulfilling his mission in this world. Living as a sent one has two aspects to it. It's to live one's life aware of the mission of God in the world today that he intends to use people like me and like you in the fulfillment of it. I'm aware that that's God's plan. It's amazing to me how many people who attend churches regularly don't even begin to understand or accept the reality that that is God's plan. It's not the pastoral staff's plan alone. It's not somebody else's plan, a famous evangelist or Bible teacher some way. And sometimes we put so much of our hope and so much of our trust and so much of our respect in these people. God's plan in the world today is to use people like you and like me to fulfill his mission. Living as sent ones begins with an awareness that that's his plan, to know that, to realize that, to accept that as true. But most importantly, and secondly, it's to actively embrace that reality, to seek to live on mission with God, meaning you're not just aware that that's God's plan, you have embraced that plan and you're searching for ways to live that out, to embrace that as part of your life. And Sometimes that's the biggest step to take, to move from knowing something to be true and then living one's life in the reality of that truth. If the intent of Jesus was then and is now to send his disciples into this world as his father had sent him, some important questions arise, at least they do in my mind, like why was he sent? How was he sent? And what can we learn from the way Jesus was sent into the world that should inform and shape the way we are sent as followers of Jesus into this world. I'd like for us to consider today not merely the fact that Jesus was sent, not just the fact of his sending, but the reason for his sending and the manner in which he was sent. So let's take a moment to think about, a few moments to think about the reason for his sending. Why did God send his son into the world? You know, he could have seen the course of human history take a turn for the worse when man rebelled against God and said, you know what, let's do a great big do-over. Let's just set that one aside, squash that pot up, redo the clay, and start over again fresh. But he chose not to do that. His plan was to reveal the magnificence of his grace and his mercy in a redemptive plan for fallen mankind. The verse that follows perhaps the most quoted Bible verse, at least in many of our churches, is this one. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And some of you will recognize that follows right on the heels of John 3.16. We quote John 3.16 a lot, but many times we don't think about verse 17 a whole lot. It tells us why God did not send his son, and it tells us why he did send his son in this one verse. And here Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus the reality of this. Unfortunately, much of contemporary society perceives American evangelicalism in just the opposite manner from what we read in verse 17 of John 3. So let me list, read it for you again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Sadly, to many people, we are seen as primarily condemning, not offering meaningful solutions to the problems for which many people are desperately looking for some form of salvation. They may not know what it should look like, but they're grappling with the brokenness of their lives in a sin-cursed world. Rather than focusing on and pointing people to Jesus and his gracious kingdom, we have at times excessively focused on seeking the dominance of our values over others through earthly power, being quick to judge and point out the ways in which people are worthy of condemnation. But that's not the way of Jesus in mission. 
Not if what he says himself here in John 3, 17 is really, really true. Jesus was not sent to condemn. Jesus was sent to save. And he was ready to make substantial personal sacrifices in order to do so. Understanding that people were already condemned in their sin, he was focused on bringing redemption, bringing hope, bringing new life. In his encounter with Zacchaeus later in Luke chapter 19, Jesus described his mission in this way. These are Jesus' own words speaking of himself. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's in Luke 19 verse 10. You know, there are two kinds of lost people in the world. Those who are lost and don't even know it, and those who are lost and are desperately aware that they're lost. My wife usually knows when we're on a road trip before I do that I'm lost. It comes a little slower to me to admit that I'm lost. She's been there for minutes, maybe hours already. And when it comes to our spiritual lives and our, ex ex our, our existence in this world, there are a lot of people that surround us who are lost. They've, they've, they've deviated off the course that God intended for men and women. And sin has corrupted themselves as individuals. It's corrupted their relationships. They see the brokenness in their own lives and the world around them. And some of them can understand that there's something not right. They know there's something amiss. And there's others who don't yet recognize that. Jesus said to Zac Zacchaeus, he came to seek and to save those kind of people. Do you notice what he said here in Zacchaeus, who's taking the initiative? Jesus says he is the one who's doing the seeking, not waiting for men and women to somehow find their way to him. No, his love compels him to action, to draw near to the sinner, which is the opposite behavioral practice of the religious community of that day. Religious leaders, those who really had it good with God in their eyes, stayed far away from sinners. Jesus' love, on the other hand, compels him to draw near to the sinner. And as you read the gospel stories with your eyes wide open, you recognize he spends an awful lot of time around people like that. And God is still intent on fulfilling this same mission through the work of his son and in the power of his spirit as we are sent into our world with the good news of the kingdom, that there is forgiveness of sin and the guilt that comes with it and there is wholeness of life in Christ. He's making all things new. That includes all that is broken inside of us and all that is broken in our world around us. Jesus is working toward making all things new. And in John chapter 20, Jesus is saying to his followers, I am sending you into that mission. Have you embraced that mission as his follower? Were you aware of the fact that when you came to follow Christ, you were embracing his mission? and going where he is going, because that's what it meant in those days when these men in John 20 accepted the call to follow Christ. That meant they were going where he was going, sleeping where he slept, eating the food that he ate, experiencing life with Jesus. Are you looking for ways in which you can embody the same purpose in word and deed among the people with whom God has given you connections or relationships? Now let's think for a few moments about the manner in which Jesus was sent. We've been talking about the reason for his sending. How was he sent? What did it look like? How did he play out? How did he behave in the way he was sent? Theologians use a word to describe the manner in which Jesus, the eternal member of the Trinity, was sent. That word is incarnation. The English word is derived from Latin that means literally to be made in flesh or to be made into flesh. Something that was not flesh is now in bodily form. This concept is most eloquently described in the New Testament in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, where John writes in verse 14, and the word 
became flesh, the word referring to Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we have seen with our eyes, John was saying, we have seen with our eyes his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, father full of grace, full of truth. Jesus here described as the word and a member of the eternal, infinite Godhead condescended to the point of taking on human form in all of its frailty. Jesus got tired. Jesus at times probably had bad breath. He got aches and pains from sleeping in uncomfortable positions. He got so exhausted he could even fall asleep in the middle of a pitching boat in a storm at sea. He experienced human frailty. He became a man born of a young, poor Hebrew woman in the Middle East. Not the epicenter of power in those days. He wasn't just born as a man. He was born as a man into a very poor, marginalized family. He probably wouldn't have been born into most of the families that are the kinds of families that are represented here today. We have a nice home. We have plenty of food. We're citizens of a very powerful nation. That was not Jesus' story. However, in all that condescension, he stopped short of one common human ex experience or characteristic, sin. That's what set this man apart different from all others who were born. There was no corruption of his character or in his behavior that would separate him from God. Not on his account. But there was corruption in my character and there was corruption in my behavior that would one day on a cross later separate him from his father. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He is God condescending to live and walk among us, to experience the frailty of human existence and identify with our limitations, our sufferings, and yes, even identify and understand our temptations. To illustrate the grace of God as he teaches on the grace of giving, Paul uses this example of how God, or how Jesus came into the world in a self-sacrificing way in order to fulfill the mission of his Father. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, he's teaching on giving. The point of this section of his letter is to teach about giving. But in the middle of that, he uses Jesus' condescension as an example. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. How did this grace of our Lord Jesus evidence itself in the manner of his being sent into our world? I'm going to give you three suggestions on what that looked like in some practical terms. First of all, he came to where people are so that he could take them to where they should be. And I don't mean just in this life to come or in the life just to come. He didn't just come to help make it easy for people somehow someday to get into heaven. Not, not that place, but he came also to make people be where they should be on a pathway in this life as well. A life that readies me for heaven will make a difference in this life as well. And in the pursuit of that, Jesus did not distance himself from people. He did not expect them to clean themselves up. He did not expect them to make themselves presentable before coming to him. We tend to want to do that to people. He identifies with sinners. He becomes like them in human flesh, but with one glaring exception, as I mentioned, without any sin. But in spite of that, he develops close personal friendships with these people. He went right to where they were in all their messiness and in all of their sin. Why would the Son of God hang out with messed up sinful people? I believe it's because he loved them. And you know what? I believe they could tell he did as well. 
In fact, he spent so much time with people like this that he developed a reputation in the religious crowd. His reputation was, yeah, that Jesus. That's that guy that's a friend of sinners. And they meant it in a pejorative, critical sense. I believe somewhere in the heart of Jesus, whenever he would hear that accusation hurled against him, it gave him a warm feeling in his heart. That's exactly who I am. And sometimes I have to ask myself, who are we as the church today, alive at this moment in our history, in this country, in this place, in the communities where we live? Do people make that kind of criticism of us? Do they make that kind of criticism of me? On one such occasion recorded in Matthew 11, in responding to some of his critics, Jesus said, the son, these are Jesus' words speaking about himself. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Why did Jesus develop this reputation, or how did this come to be? What was his behavior that provoked such a reputation? In the opening verses of Luke chapter 15, while engaged in a teaching session with a crowd of people, his disciples and more that were gathering, and that happened to him frequently, we see one example. Verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15 record this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. It's interesting that Luke uses this phrase. Luke himself says, well, there are tax collectors, and we kind of know what that is. That's their job. That's their vocation. And then he uses this generic term, the tax collectors and sinners, you know, all these people of bad reputation. We're all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, these are the appointed religious leaders of the Jewish community of the day. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners, and worse than just letting them be in his presence, he actually goes to their houses, and it says he eats with them. He would go into their homes, and he would share fellowship with them over a meal, which in Middle Eastern culture meant a huge amount of respect and acceptance given. Jesus was not averse to associating with people of bad reputation. I previously mentioned Zacchaeus, a man with such a reputation in his community. Among other things, he was known to cheat people and swindle people in their taxes as a pawn of the occupying Roman government. So when Jesus essentially invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house as a house guest, the religious leaders were deeply offended at the behavior of Jesus. He did it in wide open public view. In front of a crowd, he invites himself. You read the story in Luke 15. It wasn't that Zacchaeus says, hey, Jesus, would you come over to my house? No, Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' house. And not just to have a meal, but the implication or inf inference is to stay in his house for an extended time as a house guest. Luke 19, 7 tells us, and when they, the religious leaders of the day, saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Living as a sent one in the way that Jesus was sent, means we are willing to walk in the way of our Savior, seeing those apart from Christ not as our enemies, not as people to be shunned, criticized, attacked, or condemned, but people to whom we should draw near, even as Jesus kindly and graciously came to where we are. Are there such people in your various social circles awaiting such steps from you toward them? Or do they get messages from us sometimes that we'd like to keep our distance? Is there, is there anything about the attitude or perspectives we have toward those outside the church that is creating a barrier between you and them and between them hearing about this good news of the kingdom, this saving, slain, resurrected Messiah, Savior, who has come to, to put things back together and make things new in their lives. Let's take a look at a second aspect of the manner in which Jesus went. Not only was he somebody who came to where people are so that he could take them to where they should be, he denied his own rights for the benefit of those he came to serve. There's no avoiding it. 
to join the mission into which Jesus is sending his followers means to learn how to, at times, to say no to self for the benefit and blessing of others. This requires the gracious work of God in us. It doesn't come, na- I don't know about you, it doesn't come naturally to me, and I expect it probably doesn't come naturally to you, to say no to myself and this predisposition that I have above all others to serve self. I'm kind of hardwired to intuitively react that way to situations. I'm still growing in this area, and I expect I will be until the last day of my life here on this earth. I crave too much at times things that I can easily see as my rights. Comfort, control, respect, wealth, affirmation, acceptance, approval. And while those things in and of themselves are not evil, I can make idols out of them in my life allowing them to dictate the way I establish my priorities and conduct my life, including how I relate to and respond to other people. But Jesus himself sets our example in the way he was sent into the world. Paul, in writing a letter to the church in Philippi in verses 5 through 8 of chapter 2, says this about Jesus and the way he came into our world. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, in other words, As a follower of Jesus, him working out his life in you and through you, you can move in this direction because you have this mind in Christ, but we need to embrace it and accept it and by his grace pursue it. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Something to, this is mine and I ain't letting go of it. Jesus didn't take that attitude. But he emptied himself, verse 7 goes on to say, taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus did not cling to his rights, but he willingly laid them aside for the benefit of undeserving people, not out there somewhere, but for people like you and for people like me. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to give, not to take. He came in humility, not in arrogance. Living as a sent one means adopting such a similar attitude and posture in our world today. And I want to tell you, with all the conviction I can, this is a world hungry, desperately hungry, to see authentic followers of Jesus who display that kind of mind and behavior. It sees far too little of it, in my experience third way that Jesus came in terms of the manner of his being sent. He loved, number three, he loved sinful people even when he was misunderstood, mistreated, and rejected by them. Jesus knew what it meant to be misunderstood even by those he came to save and serve. Not just by the general public and governing authorities, but even among members of his own earthly family. John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11 tell us that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. He experienced gross mistreatment and injustice. He was rejected by those in positions of power and authority. But in spite of all that, he willingly loved to the point of offering himself an ultimate sacrifice for sin. This was his mission. This was why he was sent. The Apostle Paul understood this well on a personal level and wrote of the deep love of God that sent Jesus to the cross. In Romans 5, verses 6 to 8, we read these words, For while we were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Every now and then you'll hear this wonderful story. Sometimes you hear it in in the news even today when we live. Somebody who sacrifices his or her life for the sake of of a child or somebody who's trapped and in need of rescuing and someone will give his or her life to save that person. He says, Paul, Paul says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. It happens in human experience that we see that happen. Verse eight goes on to say, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we got cleaned up and made ourselves presentable. He didn't wait till we sort of showed some sort of God interest or disposition towards spiritual things, even. Jesus came and gave himself as payment for sin to people who weren't even in the beginning stages of those kind of journeys. That's how much he loves sinners. And Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.16, the verse I referred to earlier, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. His only son. We've only got one son. We've got a couple daughters. We've only got one son. It's hard for me to imagine what it would be like to give up a son. For people who were in rebellion, people who might curse you, Living as sent ones means we are, by God's grace, learning to love those whom Christ loves in a manner that is beyond our natural abilities. And we all know people like that. Maybe not in our own personal immediate circles of relationships, but pick up the paper, read the news, hear the stories of what's being circulated around in our society and culture today, and there are groups and blocks of people that we would go, oof, I could never imagine myself being around that crowd. Those are the very kind of people Jesus loves. And living as a sent one means we're learning by God's grace to love those whom Christ loves in a manner that's beyond our natural abilities. And in so doing, we walk in the way of Christ, sent even as he was sent. This is the calling he extends to us today. Not sometime in the future when we think we've improved ourselves enough to engage in God's redemptive purpose and mission in the world. Step into that purpose now. He will grow you by his grace as you step out and follow him. Think back to those guys in that room in John 20, the very place we started today. Was that a brave, highly educated, really well experienced, talented group of men who were ready to take the world over for Jesus? Very far from that. These are the guys that in recent months had argued among themselves who's going to be the greatest. These are the guys that could be critical of people that weren't in the same particular religious school that they were. They they had all kinds of issues and problems. And here they are hiding out in fear. And if you had to say, come up with a master plan to take over the world for the kingdom of God, you wouldn't have picked these 11 guys out of a crowd probably. And Jesus' call on us today is not for some future time when we have upped our game and you, and you think you're a better person than you are today and now God's ready to use you. No, that calling is on us today. And this is the calling he extends not just today but to all of us. Everybody who's here who knows and follows Christ. It's not just to those who have some special calling to relocate to some distant foreign country like Matt and Nikki Paschal or Dave and Kari Arnhold. They're following God's call on their lives. Are you following God's call on your life? Where you are now, where I am now. Christ desires to go with each of us who have come to know him by his grace through faith as we step into the world into which he has placed us in fulfillment of God's redemptive mission. May we each and together by his grace respond to that call to live as his sent ones even as Jesus was sent. A world is waiting at your doorstep today. I don't know what step God wants you to take. I don't know if today you're here as somebody who maybe is in that category of lust. You may know your lust. You may know something's not right. You may not yet understand that fully. You may be somebody here who has settled the question of who you're who your Lord is and who you're following in life, who you're trusting, and that's Jesus. And, you know, maybe some step he wants you to take is take, say, you know what, I'm going to show up and take that course Mike spoke about earlier. It's not just going to talk about faraway places and other countries. It's going to talk about what that looks like here and now, too, where we all live. Maybe that's the step God wants you to take. But there really wasn't in God's design for a place to say, yeah, all those other people over there, they're, they're busy in this, but he doesn't really need me. And I have no role to play. 
That's not the way God designed this. Most of us in this room are as qualified to be sent by Jesus into the world as those 11 men were in that room that night. I guarantee you that. How will you respond to that calling? That's for you to decide. And I pray that by his grace, he'll help you to take that first step of faith to do that. Let's pray together. Father, we are so very, very grateful for the fact that Jesus did not <clears throat> stay far, but he came near. And by his grace, he's identified with us as sinful people offering himself for our redemption. God, may by your grace, you use each one of us to step into that mission and proclaim that good news of your kingdom that Jesus has shared with us for your glory and for the blessing of the nations, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing one more song, an old hymn, one you'll recognize. And in keeping with David's message, it helps if you turn up the guitar. Sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, oh, but now am found, was blind. Was grace, was grace that taught my heart to fear and raise my fears, relieve. Oh, how precious did that grace appear? The That's 
You guys can hear me okay? I got as uh, ma many, I don't know if Dave mentioned this, I might have missed a moment here, but I'm like kind of related to Dave and Joni. So uh, my brother married their daughter. So I mean, we're related, right? And um, it kind of jogged a memory. So years and years ago, about 10 years ago, actually their daughter Katie used to work here at Mission Hills Church. And if you don't, if you've never met my, my younger brother, he's two years younger than me, but he looks a lot like me. I mean, like freakishly, a lot like me. And one day, what happened was um, I had an elder of the church here approach me and say, Sam, I need to talk to you about your inappropriate relationship with Katie Hall. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I saw you two walking out into the parking lot arm in arm. And I thought to myself, what is he, what in the world is he talking about? And then it dawned on me that he had actually seen my brother walking arm in arm with Katie. And it, so it did make for a very uncomfortable conversation with one of the elders of the church. But I assure you that Nate and Katie are doing just fine and uh, great to have you guys with us. Thank you so much for being together with Mission, here at, us here at Mission Hills Church. Uh, just a couple quick things before you go. Um, first is uh, we... Uh, thank you so much for your continued generosity to the church, your donations and gifts. Uh, we're grateful for that. Many of you already given online. There is a giving box over on the, at the Connection Center if you want to give a gift on your way out. Um, second thing is one thing we're really excited to share with you all today is we have the incredible privilege of baptizing one of our brothers, new brothers in Christ who came and accept, accepted Christ uh, as his Savior just a few weeks ago. And so he's going to be baptized today, right over there, in just a few minutes. So I want to encourage you, if you can, to stick around to welcome this fa new family member, member, this new brother in Christ, into the kingdom of God. So we're going to do that right over at the baptisms in a couple minutes. And lastly, um, some, there's a, somebody out here has a, a Chevy truck, and there was a key by your Chevy truck. So if you have a Chevy truck... Go to the Connection Center afterwards. They have a key. And that may be 10 of you, but one of you is bound to have a key that's missing. So anyway, I wanted to give you a heads up about that. That being said, would you hold your hands out to receive these final words from the Gospel of John? I do not ask that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So go knowing that God has not removed you from the world and all of its decay and corruptions, but that he has kept you in it and sent you to it. Blessings and be at peace with the Lord. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm. 